Let's talk about uh, who's to blame for all these uh, stories in the airline industry, all these troubling trends coming out of the airline industry about how uh, planes are uh, falling apart and all these uh, recent reports. And these are genuine concerns. But a lot of people are scapegoating uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Someone for uh, Vox wrote this article. No, DEI is not making airplanes fall apart. They talk about how the news cycle is awash with terrifying stories about air travel safety. At the start of the month, the door plug of a Boeing 737 MAX 9 blew off mid-flight, leaving a gaping hole on the side of the Alaska Airlines plane. Over the weekend, another Boeing passenger jet's nose wheel fell off just before the Delta flight took off. I think there was another story about how, like, United, some of United Airlines planes are falling apart or whatever. And yeah, a lot of people, especially from the right, are quick to blame DEI. And you have people like Charlie Kirk and uh, clueless Candace Owens uh, taking it a step further. Charlie Kirk says, I'm sorry. If I see a black pilot, I'm going to be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. Candace Owens says, I would be terrified, terrified. If I got into a plane and I saw a woman flying the plane, and a reason why they say this is because, uh, hey, maybe these uh, these are diversity hires. Some have pointed out that this uh, line of thinking when it comes to pilots is ridiculous because to become a pilot, uh, it's mandated by federal law that you go through rigorous training and education. So it's not like an airline can just arbitrarily uh, make uh, diversity hires without people going through the uh, proper training protocols. And then as a side note, I mean, how is this different? How is uh, what Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens, how is this different than how a lot of uh, identity politics lunatics from the left, whenever they throw around the uh, concept of white privilege, which is based on this notion that uh, systemic racism exists or past systemic racism uh, is somehow a benefit to uh, white people. And so if they ever see a white person in a position of power or whatever, they're going to assume that it's a result of their uh, white privilege. You're seeing the same mentality from people on the right, like Charlie Kirk and clueless Candace Owens. Now, if they see uh, a non-white person uh, piloting a plane or even a woman piloting a plane, uh, their first instinct is going to be, well, I wonder if they're uh, qualified. I wonder if they're properly trained because uh, systemic racism from DEI policies, uh, they must be a diversity hire or whatever. How is this any different? But some have pointed out that it might not be, that the piloting issue might not be what it is. It might be more so... Companies like Boeing when it comes to building the planes. And yes, both Boeing and a lot of these airlines, they do pledge uh, to uh, adhere to uh, DEI uh, policies and whatnot. It's, uh, they say so on their own company's websites. But what I find astonishing is that no one has even considered the possibility that these uh, faulty planes... Well, first off, a lot of this might be... I don't want to say it's overblown. I mean, these are genuine concerns. We're talking about uh, passenger jets and whether or not they're safe. You know, when I get on a plane, I want to know that it's going to take off and land safely and that the pilots are qualified and trained. I would love to uh, be rest assured of that. But first off, all these reports, they might be overblown. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not ruling out that possibility. But I do find it amazing that no one's considering that this might be a consequence of government corruption, of government intervention, industrial policy that is uh, turned uh, companies like Boeing into somewhat of a monopoly in their various history. I mean, if you even... Uh, just Google Boeing and uh, Monopoly and tariffs and whatnot. There's a long history of Boeing enjoying government favors like tax breaks and subsidies and uh, other favors that uh, lock out, discourage competition, especially from overseas. There's this article from 2017 that reports how the United States upholded a 300% uh, duty on uh, bombardier jets which was a big win for Boeing. Yay! 
Yeah, Jets made uh, by Bombardier. The U.S. Uh, Commerce Department on Wednesday finalized duties of nearly 300% on passenger jets made by Bombardier, a win for Boeing, which lodged a complaint against its Canadian rival. And then there was a 17-year dispute between uh, Boeing and Airbus. Airbus, which is a European company. And it was just this uh, constant back and forth. There, There's an article on Reuters that... Uh, sort of glosses over the details going back to uh, 2004 about all these uh, trade restrictions and subsidies that have been given to Airbus and Boeing, where uh, each uh, company was getting restricted in various parts of the world. I guess it was finally resolved in 2021. And thankfully, one of my favorite economists, Scott Linscombe, finally reported on this, talking about how industrial policy's corruption problem is hiding in plain sights. Boeing's troubles reveal another risk of government support for national champions. He published this on January 24th of this year on the dispatch. Not going to read the entire article, but, um, right here, he talks about how, um, what does this all have to do with Boeing? Well, contrary to what you might read on the internet, LOL, Boeing is not some free market creation and instead has a long and well-documented history of being supported by and intertwined with the U.S. government. In fact, free marketers have long seen the company as a poster child for federal corporatism and crony capitalism particularly as it relates to the Export-Import Bank, which provides subsidized financing for U.S. exports. DeRugney provided some of the glory details last year. According to Executive Gov, in 2021, 49% of Boeing's revenue, $23 billion worth, came from the federal government. Boeing receives loads of tax breaks and infrastructure support from state and local governments. For decades, Boeing was the biggest beneficiary of the Export-Import Bank, so much so that XM's COVID response was designed with Boeing specifically in mind. Boeing's commercial sales are often brokered by the U.S. government. For example, Air India's recent order of over 200 Boeing jets was announced by President Biden. President Trump announced Qatar's purchase of five Boeing 777 freighters in 2019. President Obama was present when Vietjet Airlines signed a deal to purchase 100 Boeing 737 MAX airplanes, and he even once quipped that he deserves a gold watch for selling so many Boeing planes. Boeing moved its headquarters to Washington, D.C., area to the Washington, D.C. area when existing tax subsidies in Chicago ran out. <laughs> Also, no doubt, contributing to this move was Boeing's recognition that its future depends mightily on government appropriations and the favor of regulators. Boeing's lobbying operation, meanwhile, is as massive as you would expect it with, oh, with more than 100 lobbyists on the payroll and a budget of more than $10 million per year. The influence peddling also extends to the company's subtractors, including one Wichita-based Spirit Aerosystems, at the center of the latest 737 MAX controversy. That company is now run by Patrick Shanahan, who was Donald Trump's acting defense secretary and faced an ethics probe into allegations of favoritism toward the aerospace giant. Trump literally referred to him as his Boeing guy in public. All this cronyism, it should be noted, is a rare bit of left-right agreement among D.C. policy wonks, though, of course, everyone disagreed about whether this issue demands more or less government involvement. Writing in The American Prospect, a progressive publication, Alexander Salmon in 2019 called Boeing an adjunct of the states, one that received more federal, federal money then all but one U.S. corporation, Lockheed Martin, and even many government agencies, including the EPA and the Department of the Interior. He's certainly not alone on that side of the, of the aisle. Salmon, De Rugney, and others also seem to agree that Boeing's connections to and support from the government may be to blame, at least in part, for the 737 MAX's continued problems. As De Rugney documented last year, Boeing got Congress to change the law and reduce the Safety standards uh -oh, 
SpaghettiOs. Apply to the as yet uncertified newer variants of the 737 MAX. The company's cozy relationship with the regulators has also played a role in the 737 MAX's catastrophic crashes. Salmon, meanwhile, says that all of this corporatism fomented a weakened regulatory environment that certified the jets and kept production lines humming even as internal problems mounted. Others have similarly warned of federal regulators being captured by Boeing due to their close working relationship across various agencies. Here's how Bloomberg investigative reporter Peter Robinson, the author of Flying Blind, the 737 MAX tragedy and the fall of Boeing, described it to Bloomberg podcaster Tracy Alloway. Tracy asks, what about the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration? So I don't think we can have this conversation about the incentives and the structure of the system that created this bad outcome without talking about the relationship between Boeing and the FAA. Peter says, yes, because that turned into a bad relationship. The FAA, especially the FAA management, began to see its role as helping Bowie in its goal of delivering airplanes. And the incentives for managers became almost to see that the aircraft industry as a customer rather than a regulated entity. You know, I wrote about more cases in my book where the FAA manager in charge of monitoring Boeing would go on to get a job at Boeing or at the industry lobbying group. So that problem with the revolving door is there. Even NPR recently came into the dis- to the same conclusion, noting that XM subsidies and other government support for Boeing undergirded the cozy ties between the company and U.S. regulators. Ties that, per various experts they interviewed, may be partly to blame for the 737 MAX continued problems. None of this is to argue that Boeing management and corporate policy don't deserve Some of the blame for the company's longstanding problems, nor is it an argument against any and all government involvement per se, but the well-documented experience of the United States Aircraft National Champion and the government agency supposed to keep it in check does raise another lesser discussed concern about all the tariffs, local content mandates, procurement preferences, and trillions in taxpayer subsidies that the U.S. government is today doling out to boost the competitiveness of certain strategic industries and the U.S. economy more broadly. As PIIE's Adam Poston wrote last year, citing Boeing and Airbus as his prime examples, history shows that rather than converging on best practices or at least putting useful competitive competitive pressure on domestic industries, subsidy races lead to a perpetuation of corruption that stifles innovation and generates other economic harms that undermine the subsidy's main objective. So yeah, when you get all of these government favors, when uh, companies start getting uh, favors like uh, competitors being excluded from the market or discouraged from the market and start getting subsidies... Um, It should be no surprise when uh, quality starts to decline because they're not uh, they're not they're they're less and less incentivized to create quality products to uh, appeal to consumers when they know that uh, politicians will be more than happy to give them, uh, according to Linscombe, trillions of dollars worth of tax breaks and subsidies and lock out their competitors. While we're on the topic of industrial policy and its failures, um, let's talk about uh, Josh Hawley, who I often refer to as Missouri Mussolini, because he's a total economic fascist. Today, he uh, got upset because a major, according to Josh Hawley, a major aluminum plant in southeast Missouri just announced it's shutting down. This cannot be allowed to happen. The plant accounts for nearly 30% of the nation's aluminum. It is vital to national security. President Biden must invoke the Defense Production Act and keep it open. Adding that some billionaire wants to put 500 Missourians out of work and walk away with the profit. <laughs> That cannot happen. This plant and these workers are too important to the nation to shut down. 
And uh, he wrote this in a statement. There have been articles published about this, about how he's uh, asking the president to invoke the Defense Production Act and keep the MAG-7 aluminum plant alive. I think it might be worth uh, noting that one of the reasons why this plant, it's not like this plant has been thriving, that it's a well-operating plant, and that the, some greedy billionaire just wants to shut it down so that he can put an extra nickel in his pocket. But it might be worth noting that uh, this aluminum plant that Josh Hawley is talking about has kind of been on life support for years. This is an article from February of 2020. So this is before all of the lockdowns happened. This was before there were even discussions of COVID lockdowns. Aluminum smelter resurrected after Trump tariffs may close as losses mount. Again, it's from February 28th of 2020. A bankrupt aluminum smelter that reopened in 2018. So it reopened in 2018 after the U.S. President Donald Trump imposed tariffs on imported metals. So this plant that's about to close down again, was on life support and uh, needed government favors to stay alive. American consumers had to pay more for imported metal to save a few hundred jobs. Is losing money at such a rapid clip that it could close within 60 days, the top executive at the Missouri plant said on Thursday. Magnitude 7 aluminum fetches about $1,680 a ton on metals market, down from about $2,100 a year ago. The last time the aluminum plant closed, it was a body blow to the economy and the country's morale. Or the county's morale. Yeah, it was the county's morale. A bankrupt aluminum smelter that reopened in 2018 after U.S. President Donald Trump imposed tariffs on imported metals is losing money at such a rapid clip that it could close within 60 days. The top executive said Trump's trade policies protect the generic aluminum product made by Magnitude 7 Metals, a 50-year-old smelter on the banks of the Mississippi in southeastern Missouri. But the tariffs often do not cover the value-added aluminum products being shipped to the United States by foreign competitors, undercutting the company's position. The rest of the world has gamed the tariffs, in our opinion, MAG-7 Metals Chief Executive Charles really told Reuters in an interview. The Commerce Department tried to help, but it missed the mark. The grim outlook for the plant has been exacerbated by the coronavirus. So I guess the coronavirus might be partly to blame, which is reverberating around the globe while raising fears of a global recession. On Friday, the London Metal Exchange fell to $1,600 per ton, the lowest since October 2016. If things do not turn around in the next 60 days, I don't know. Now I got to wonder. Um, I'd probably have to look into this. I wonder if this is one of the businesses, uh, if it's one of these uh, zombie companies that was kept alive by all of the uh, money, the trillions of dollars that was being thrown around in 2020 to save jobs, to keep businesses that were impacted by lockdowns and COVID afloat. But then there's the fact that, um, so Josh Hawley talks about how this is a big national security issue. The plant counts for uh, 30% of the aluminum. I saw um, someone on Twitter bring up the fact that a new plant, a new aluminum plant is being built in Alabama. And this was reported uh, two years ago by the state of Alabama about how uh, Novalis plans to invest $2.5 billion to open Alabama aluminum plant, creating 1,000 jobs, 1,000 jobs. So twice as many jobs as the plant that uh, Josh Hawley is freaking out about. Someone point out, like, it's clearly not a national defense issue if uh, we're getting a new plant in Alabama. It's not like America is just going to run short of aluminum. And Biden has uh, continued this... Uh, This aluminum policy, this is from 2022. I think I've talked about this before. Call them the Biden-Trump tariffs now. U.S. beverage makers and consumers continue to pay for tariffs on aluminum that the president won't lift. Oh, you absolutely suck. You guys know that. uh, Do I have one here? No, I guess I I I threw it away. Uh, I drank a lot of uh, canned soda. President Biden has rolled back some of Donald Trump's destructive tariffs, but not enough, and they're still doing economic harm. New analyses from Mr. Trump's Section 
232 steel and aluminum tariffs show how consumers and manufacturers are still paying for the border taxes that benefit only a few companies. I mean, we got to do it again to keep these uh, aluminum plants alive that have been struggling and on life support for years. And if those favors aren't enough, then just, uh, hey, invoke the uh, Defense Production Act. That will ma magically uh, save the jobs, I guess. A study by Harbor Aluminum for the Beer Institute finds that the 10% tariff on imported aluminum costs U.S. beverage manufacturers $1.7 billion from March 2018 through August of 2022. About 93% of the $1.7 billion has been pocketed by domestic aluminum producers and smelters in the United States and Canada. Only $120 million has gone to the U.S. government. More than 70% of aluminum in cans is made from recycled scrap metal, which is not subject to the tariffs. Most aluminum imports come from Canada. Canada. Again, Canada. You ever criticize the economic impacts of it? Then they just go to China, 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 China. Yet a lot of these tariffs are imposed on goods that are imported from Canada, which is uh, not an enemy of the United States. Which, since 2019, aside from the brief reversal in 2020, is no longer covered by the Section 232 tariffs. So beverage manufacturers do not have to pay tariffs on the vast majority of metal that goes into beer and soda cans. Yet the tariffs still increase costs for beverage makers as they let domestic aluminum producers raise prices for U.S. manufacturers that buy the metal. This is what tariffs typically do. By raising the cost of production, tariffs constrain manufacturers who cut jobs and pass costs on to consumers. A recent paper, so again, if we go back to uh, this issue of the aluminum smelter in Missouri, yeah, uh, the tariffs might, uh, they might bring back jobs here and there, but they cost jobs in other areas of the economy. A recent paper from Tax Foundation estimates that repealing the Section 232 tariffs would boost long-run GDP by 0.02% and create about 4,000 jobs. The Tax Foundation's estimates are a lower bound in part because they do not account for the potential positive effects of countries repealing the retaliatory tariffs they impose on U.S. goods in response to the steel and aluminum levies, the report notes. China and Turkey together still impose more than $1 billion worth of retaliatory tariffs on U.S. exports, the Tax Foundation reported in April. The $2.9 billion dollars of tariff revenue that the government collects on imported steel and aluminum is down from five billion in 2018 but the tax foundation notes that a significant share of u.s imports of steel and aluminum are still subject to the tariffs and even temporary tariffs can have persistent effects tariffs change trade flows and can open the door to competitors to grab market share from u.s companies with higher costs Repealing the tariffs could reduce prices at the margin. The longer they stay in place, the more they deserve to be called the Biden-Trump tariffs. You're goddamn right. And then there's this uh, piece on Reason Magazine. Josh Hawley thinks the White House can force the aluminum plant to stay open. Should there be any limits to a president's power to centrally plan the economy? Apparently not. This is written by Eric Bohm on January 26th of this year, 2024. In response... Okay, we've already... Uh, We've already went through that. It might shock Hawley and some of his colleagues to learn that, defense, that the Defense Production Act is not some set of magic words that allows the president to do whatever they would like. All the law does require is that businesses fulfill orders from the government before orders from pri private customers. That is because it is a law meant to be used during wartime. Here's how it works. Let's say there's a war going on and the U.S. military desperately needs 10,000 widgets to ensure victory, lasting peace, and blah, blah, blah. The Pentagon sends a guy to the widget factory in Albuquerque to request those 10,000 widgets, but the owner of the factory says the 10,000 widgets sitting on his lot have already been purchased by his friend Bob and that the government will have to wait until the factory can produce another 10,000 widgets. So come back in two weeks. Ah, but wait, the president just signed an order invoking the Defense Production Act for widgets, so now the guy from the, Pen from the Pentagon gets to cut the line. 
He can buy those 10,000 widgets and Bob has to wait for the next set to come off the assembly line. That's what the, prevent the Defense Production Act allows. It cannot conjure up new solar panels or additional supplies of insulation out of thin air. It does not allow the government to put a gun to anyone's head and force them to make baby formula or to keep an aluminum plant smelter running. And that's good. Let's consider for a moment the alternative reality where Holly apparently resides, a reality where the Defense Production Act somehow gives the sitting president, president the power to shape not only whole industries, but to direct exactly what products are manufactured in these places. Sure, why shouldn't presidents have the authority to decide how many people are employed in which factories all across the country? No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. Once, I might have asked a different rhetorical question about whether conservatives would want to live in a country where the president had such immense powers over the markets. But it is now increasingly apparent that many of them do. Oh, you absolutely suck! That's a seriously toxic problem in our politics right now. Large portions of both major parties are committed to the idea that more central planning and a more powerful chief executive would benefit the country economically. And that's why there is so much chatter about the Defense Production Act and why the federal government is wasting so much money on other centrally planned boondoggles. Hawley's call for more government intervention to protect aluminum manufacturing jobs should also spur some reflection about the last major government intervention that was supposed to protect aluminum manufacturing jobs. Remember those 10% tariffs on imported aluminum? Oh, here we go. Imposed by then-President Donald Trump in 2018? That was naked protectionism. By the way, again, it's worth reminding that Donald Trump is running on increasing uh, tariffs by... 10% more across the board, just in case anyone is still under the illusion that all this protectionism is all about uh, protecting America from China, 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 China. Blow it out your ass. That was naked protectionism, and the announced closure of this Missouri smelter seems like pretty good evidence that it failed. Yeah, like I've been saying. There's other evidence, too. As Hawley points out in his letter, this is the third aluminum smelter in the U.S. to announce plans to downsize in the recent months. Unfortunately, the failures of protection of protectionism only seem to spur calls for more protectionism. Finally, let's address the idea that American national security is somehow weakened by the closure of a single aluminum plant that employs 400 people. In some ways, this is the crux of Hawley's argument for feder for the federal government to get involved. In that letter to the White House, he wrote that the impending shutdown of the smelter will also materially degrade our defense posture as the DOD has deemed aluminum a strategic material interest. It's true that the United States does not produce enough aluminum to meet its annual demand, which is why we imported 5.9 million metric tons of it in 2022. But here's the good news. There is plenty of aluminum available on the global market. And there would be more if the Biden administration lifted those tariffs. In 2022, more than 41% of the aluminum imported into the United States from Canada and Mexico. Canada and Mexico. Again, guys, China, 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 China. Hardly places that are likely to cut off trade in the event of a war. South Korea and Australia, also close U.S. allies, are the fastest growing suppliers of aluminum to the United States. It is, of course, unfortunate that the closing of this aluminum smelter means about 400 workers will be out of a job. Hopefully, they will quickly find others. Well, you know what would make it easier for them to find others is if we uh, lifted a lot of these bullshit ass trade restrictions and reduce these tariffs and uh, just ended all of these buy American uh, policies. As I have illustrated before, this has had pernicious impacts in uh, infrastructure. Delayed infrastructure projects means uh, delayed job opportunities for blue collar workers. 
means delayed enjoyment of said infrastructure, raises the cost of the infrastructure. Tragic as it might be in the short term, this is the sort of thing that happens all the time in, a he in healthy economic systems where resources, including labor, are constantly in flux. The idea that the closure of a single aluminum plant is a national security crisis that should require a direct intervention of the White House is frankly insane. By demanding that Biden get involved, Hawley is suggesting that there should, I'm going to, maybe I should just start referring to him as Smoot Hawley instead of Josh Hawley. Smoot Hawley. You guys remember the Smoot Hawley tariff? During the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover, the uh, the businessman turned politician, decided to run for president. And then when the economy went to shit, he tried to uh, intervene in the economy by imposing tariffs, which uh, had a disastrous impact on the economy. It was called the Smoot-Hawley tariff. Hawley is suggesting that there should be effectively no limits to a president's power to intervene in the economy, exactly the sort of unchecked expansion of executive power that Republicans used to understand would be dangerous and counterproductive. You're goddamn right. Yeah, it seems uh, that's, you know, I've been saying lately that uh, populism has become mainstream in American politics. Everyone's a fucking populist these days. And likewise, um, economic intervention, central planning, economic planning is becoming more mainstream, including amongst uh, Republicans. Republicans. <laughs>